Will you come to prayer with me this evening? As we open our hearts and our minds as God blesses us this evening. And we pray, loving God and gracious one, we thank you for Jesus. Born on this day, come again, O Holy Spirit, so that we might magnify and give honor to the one who has given us. Blessed us, God, with our open hearts and our open minds to the God who is still asleep, the God who is still present, the Emmanuel, the God who is still with us, and through this time together. O oh God, on this Christmas Eve, may we know your presence more fully and more clearly as we worship you this night. And now, O oh God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that we've spoken on this night. I may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations that come from each and all of our hearts, may they be acceptable to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So it came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. Those words with many other statements have been heard over the past several weeks as we have been answering the who questions of the Christmas gospel through Dr. Seuss's parody, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. And we all know that's not one of my favorite Christmas parodies of the year, but it's been a great series. Over the last several weeks, we've learned who Jesus was, along with Mary and Joseph, the innkeeper, and even King Herod and the wise men in this true Christmas story. Thus bringing us here this evening, Christmas Eve, as we complete our mission, complete that journey to Bethlehem and to the stable where a very frightened Mary and to be given birth. As someone's bringing our story to the high point as we welcome the Christ in Christmas. Now, some folks get a little bent out of shape this time of year when they are shopping and they're at the register and someone just says, happy holidays rather than wishing you a Merry Christmas. Now, they may think that they're being politically correct or trying to do something right and probably all know better that these cashiers, we need to give them a little slack maybe, but the word holiday literally means holy day. We've seen over the past several weeks how our characters in Dr. Seuss's books relate to some of the key characters in the actual Christmas story. But we also know from our series over the last several weeks that God has a purpose for each of us and that our lives impact the lives of others in so many ways in that those ways that we don't realize becomes a rippling effect of that impact on others. We all know the Christmas story begins, or maybe not, and if you don't recall, it starts with a reminder to file your tax return. And to be clear, it wasn't the typical Roman Empire's way of collecting taxes. They had to go back to their home city. They didn't offer that friendly reminder to take advantage of the end of the tax year breaks like we get. There were no tax extensions. There wasn't even that nine month wait for pregnancy because Mary was pregnant, but they had to get to the next tax office. We also have to remember that like Mary and Joseph, we are called to live our faith in the real world of tax deadlines, politics, and ultimately business trips. I'm pretty sure that when Mary and Joseph were planning for their baby to born, they weren't thinking about making a very inconvenient 100 mile trip to pay taxes or having their baby born in a feed trough because there was no room available at the local Holiday Inn. But if we think about the Christmas story and on that first nearly Christmas night 2,000 years ago, there were shepherds living in a field nearby, keeping over their watch of the flocks at night. And in that society and culture, in that time and place, shepherding of all things was considered a lowly position. And they were looked on and looked down upon by most people in society. But yet the angel came to them intentionally and I believe that it's a symbolic thing that the shepherds become that representation of all of us, 
while representing the good news and re representing humankind. Yet, like the shepherds, we will face unexpected challenges and ad adversities in the midst of all our careful plans that we lay out. But we have to remember all things work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to God's purpose. We also have to remember that Christ in Christmas means to remember that just like Mary and Joseph, we are called to trust in God, especially when we face or foreseen challenges that may come our way, and we know they will. Another wonderful thing for us to remember about Luke's telling of the Christmas story that not only does it remind us that we are called to trust God as we live our faith in the real world, but it reminds us that the good news of Christians offer, Christmas excuse me, offers us great joy and transformation. All of our lives have meanings in so many different ways, and we live, continue to impact those people that we come in contact with. We're also reminded by Paul that the Christ child of Christmas allows us to join with the shepherds in a revival of transformation that will only transform our lives but will have that ripple effect one after the other. This year we continue to live in these unpredictable times in our lives that we make sure that we claim Jesus within us this Christmas. We need to be reminded that it's not, not all about us. It's about the Christ child helping those who are in need and that we are generous in our sharing and our love with our community and our world. We are claiming that Christ child in us this Christmas. As we spend this evening with those special in our hearts, let us go back to the fields to tend to our flocks, allowing the good news of the Christ birth that leads us to glorify and praise God just like the shepherds did so long ago. For all people it is an important phrase to remember because the shepherds were not known to be religious people. They were considered outsiders, yet God chose the first announcement of the good child for the birth with them. After going to Bethlehem to confirm that they had been told by the angels, Luke tells us that they returned home glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. And I'm sure I've shared this wonderful story before, but it's worth hearing again on this special evening. For years now, whenever Christmas pageants are talked about in a certain little town in the Midwest, someone is sure to mention the name Wallace Perling. Wallace's performance in one annual production of the Nativity play has slipped into the realm of legend. But the old timers who were in the audience that night never tire of recalling exactly what happened. Wally was nine years old and in second grade. Mm -hmm. Though he should have been in fourth, most people in town knew that he had difficulty keeping up. He was big and awkward, slow in movement and mind. Still, Wally, was well liked by the other children in his class, all whom were smaller than he. Though the boys had trouble hiding their irritation when Wally would ask to play ball with them, or any other game for that matter, it's which winning was important. They'd find a way to keep him out, but Wally would hang around anyway, not sulking, just hoping. He was a helpful boy, always willing and smiling, and the protector and paradoxically of the underdog. If the older boys chased the younger ones away, it would be Wally would say, can't they stay? They're no bother. Wally fancied the idea of being a shepherd in the Christmas pageant. But the play directors, Miss Lombard, assigned him a more important role. After all, she re reasoned, the innkeeper did not have too many lines and Wally's size would make his refusal of lodging to Joseph more forceful. And so it happened that unusual large partisan audience gathered for the town's yearly extravaganza of crooks and creatures, of beards and crowns, halos, and the whole stage full of squeaky voices. 
No one on stage or off were more caught up in the magic of the night than Wallace Perling. They said later that he stood in the wings and watched the performance with such fascination that Miss Lombard had to make sure he didn't wander off stage before his cue. Then the time came when Joseph appeared, slowly, tenderly guiding Mary to the door of the inn. Joseph knocked hard on the wooden door to set the paint drop, painted backdrop. Wally, the innkeeper, was there, waiting. What do you want, Wally said, swinging the door with a breast gesture. We seek lodging. Seek it elsewhere, Wally spoke vigorously. The inn is filled. Sir, we have to ask everywhere in vain. We have traveled far and very far and weary. There is no room in this inn for you, Wally looked properly stern. Please, good innkeeper, this is my wife, Mary. She is heavy with child and needs a place to rest. Surely you must have some small corner for her. She is so tired. Now for the first time, the innkeeper relaxed his stiff stance and looked down at Mary. With that, there was a long pause, long enough to make the audience a bit tensed and with embarrassment. No, be gone, the prompter whispered. No, Wally repeated automatically, be gone. Joseph said, sadly placed his arm around Mary, and Mary laid her head upon her husband's shoulder, and the two of them started to move away. The innkeeper did not return inside the, his inn. However, Wally stood there in the doorway, watching the forlorn couple. His mouth was open, his brow creased with concern, his eyes filling unmistakably with tears. And suddenly, the Christmas pageant became different from all others. Don't go, Joseph, Wally called out. Bring Mary back. And Wallace Perling's face grew into the brightest smile you have ever seen in any room. Some people in that town thought the pageant had been ruined. Yet others, many others, who considered it the most of all Christmas pageants that they'd ever seen to be remarkable. Allowing the Christ in Christmas to be within us means that we join the shepherds in the revival of transformation that will only transform our lives and have that rippling effect on people. This is what Christmas is about. To share as we continue allowing the Christ to be within us, we know that it's not all about us. It's about the Christ child helping those who are in, in need. In a few moments following communion, we'll be lighting candles that, as we come to light the Christ candle. The light we hear of this evening is a gift that is offered to us. A gift that we either accept or reject. It's our choice. No one forces light upon us. The true fact of the matter is when we bring light to anything, the darkness cannot overshadow it. So as we light the candles this evening, may we do so with more attentive focus and that we will commit in the days and months ahead that we will shed light into the dark places, not just in our own lives, but out into the world so that the light of Christ that we have lit this night, the light that burns within us this night when Jesus was born, is a light of love that will always overcome hate. May it be so and may it be so, every time we are generous and sharing God's love within our community and world, we are affirming the Christ in Christmas for ourselves as well as others. I think that's worth celebrating. As we leave from this place tonight and go back into the fields to tend to our flocks, may the good news of Christ's birth lead to glorify and praise God just like the shepherds did so long ago. Merry Christmas, Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. Amen. Amen.